opportunities that we have. I'm Margaret Ioannidis, the Associate Dean of Strategy and Innovation here at Florida Coastal, and with us today is Giselle Carson, a Florida Coastal alumna and practicing immigration attorney here in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, this event is sponsored by the Florida Coastal School of Law LLM programs, and I see that several of our students have joined us today, so welcome, no matter where you are in the world. Um, we have two LLM programs, one in U.S. law for foreign educated attorneys, and the other is in logistics and transportation uh, for attorneys and also um, industry professionals. So we welcome all of you to visit us on our Facebook page and on our Twitter feed, and we want to again thank you for taking the time to join us for today's speaker series. The structure um, of today's um, talk is going to be about a 45-minute presentation by Giselle Carson. She has some outstanding PowerPoints, and she's going to provide an overview on U.S. immigration law. Um, she's going to give some perspective related to um, employment-based immigration options and a little bit as well on family-based immigration options. Um, and we have saved time at the end of her presentation for live questions and answers. Um, we encourage all of you, if you have questions, you can use the chat feature, which is on the left-hand side of your screen. You can type in questions there, um, and Giselle will have time at the end to be able to address those. In addition, you are able to speak and ask questions that way as well. Um, we ask that if you are not speaking, that you mute your microphone. So at the top of your screen, you'll see a microphone icon. Just click on that, and it will mute your microphone until you're ready to speak. Um, and we encourage this to be an interactive um, presentation, so please feel free to join us. If you are interested in doing so, click on the camera icon, um, and you'll appear on the screen as well. Um, we are recording today's presentation so that those who are not able to participate live um, can watch it, so we did want to let everyone know about that as well. So without further ado, um, Giselle, I will turn things over to you and look forward to a great presentation. So thank you, Margaret, and thank you for all of you that are out there uh, participating in, in this webinar. One of the things that I want to make sure is that everybody can hear me well. Um, so as Margaret just said, um, please let us know through the chat. Uh, we are monitoring that. Um, if you cannot hear me, uh, let us know if this is for you. Uh, something else that I wanted to say, this is this is the first, or hopefully a few, of this kind of presentation. So, and thank you for John, who just responded and said, the sound, is, sound is just fine. Thank you. Um, this is, uh, again, this is for you, but it is our first attempt at doing something like this. So please uh, forgive us if there is uh, some challenges through the presentation, but we'll try to make it as smooth as we can. Um, and I know that there are several attendees that are from um, Latin American. Actually, I, I saw the list. Several from Latin American. So to you, muchos saludos y gracias. Um, and we have people from Europe. We have people from Asia, and several also from the United States. So terrific! It's just like what immigration is all about. It's a, it's a global affair. So with that said. Um, if you want to find out a little bit more about me and our practice, uh, there is a link on the webinar uh, on that first page at the bottom. It has Mark Gray is the firm that I practice at. I've been practicing immigration law for over 10 years, and that is it's all I do. Um, so I'm primarily I practice in the areas of employment and family-based immigration. So again, to find out a little bit more about me, you can go to our website. Um, and let's just kind of give you an idea as to what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about work visas. Um, I know that many of you are interested in probably coming to the United States or are here and want to figure out how do I go from the status that I have to a work visa, or you may have clients that you're helping make the decision as to what visa they, they could qualify for. So hopefully uh, that's one of the goals that we will accomplish today. Um, we're going to talk briefly about the green card process, uh, and I say briefly because I'm going to be covering the work visas primarily, um, and the reason I'm doing that is because 
in the majority of the times uh, foreign nationals coming to the United States or in the United States, they're typically on a non-immigrant work visa and they're on that for a few months, a few years before they even consider a temp green card process, which is much more complicated, but I'll, I'll touch on it so that you have an idea as to what is involved. Uh, tips for staying out of trouble, and then, as Margaret said, we're going to do some question and answers at the end, again, to try to answer um, as many questions as I can. Um, again, immigration law is very case and fact specific, so I will not be able to answer a question that is, uh, you know, if you say, well, my situation to sell is la 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 la. Um, I'm probably going to need to talk to you uh, on a separate basis, um, and, and if, if you wanted to proceed with something like that, we do have a consultation um, feature available at our, at our firm. So this is, again, to give you a general overview of what is available out there and to answer general questions. So let's begin. The non-immigrant visas that are probably going to be most used, and there's more, it's a whole alphabet of of visas that are out there, but the ones that are most commonly used by foreign nationals coming to the United States to work are the H-1B, professional worker, the E-1, E-2, trader, um, and I'm glad that I included this in this presentation because I see that there's a few uh, foreign nationals that are from Colombia and also Mexico, and, and they can take advantage of the E. Um, there is the TN, um, that again, it's, it's, it's for professional workers and is specifically for Mexicans and Canadian nationals. And again, um, a few from Mexico on the line, so this is this is good for you, good information for you. The L1 intercompany transferee, uh, the name suggests, is uh, it's for companies to transfer workers from one company abroad to a related company in the United States. And the O1 is a very unique category. It's for those that can show that they have become um, members of the top uh, group on their field, and they have extraordinary ability. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging visa to get, but it's, it's people that can get it, and we do, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm working on an O right now. Um, it, 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 it's interesting, and it really, uh, I, I love doing the O's when people can qualify because there are people that are at the top of their field and, and it brings a lot of creativity and, and creativity and energy, which is, which is all good. So that's the overview of what we're going to cover. Let's begin with the H1. The H1B is the most sought after uh, professional uh, visa, work visa category. Um, it is specifically for what is called a specialty occupation. And a specialty occupation means it's, it's the kind of, it's the kind of um, occupation that requires at least a bachelor's degree. Is, um, as I said before, it's the most commonly used work visa. Unfortunately, it's capped. So it's, those that can use it, it's awesome, but we really need to, in this day, um, you need to look beyond the H-1B for many cases. Um, when you are granted an H-1B, it's typically valid initially for three years, and there are extensions available. It's a dual intent visa, and there's only two that are really designated as dual intent visas. And the benefit of that is that you can begin a green card process while you are on the H-1B visa without affecting your ability to apply for a green card. So that's a huge benefit of the H-1B. Um, and so a pro and a con. So a pro is the dual intent. A con, um, so something that is not so good about the H-1B, is the fact that the spouse of an H-1B worker uh, cannot obtain an employment authorization document. And I put in parenthesis general because there is a new rule that came into effect. In fact, uh, about three months ago, I, I just filed several H-4 EADs. So in, currently, some spouses of H-1B workers can apply to, to, to get employment authorization, but you have to be in the green card process to get there. 
Um, it's employer specific, meaning that if you have to have an employer that sponsors you for the H-1B. And if you have that employer and then you decided that you don't necessarily like that work or that employment, you cannot just transfer to another employer. You have to apply or the employer has to sponsor you for a new H-1B visa and then transfer your visa to them before you can apply, uh, before you can begin working for them. Um, so settlement employment is not allowed. It's profession specific. And what I mean by this is, for example, I do a lot of engineer, computer, um, computer specialists, IT workers. They have a bachelor's degree, let's say, in computer science and engineering, um, and they're coming to the United States to work in that field. If I were to get a computer, um, someone with a bachelor's degree in computer engineering, but they are not able to find it, they have an sponsor, but that sponsor is, is a restaurant. And the restaurant wants, and this, this person is a cook, and, and in addition to being a wonderful engineer, they are a wonderful cook. And what they, they want the h one to come to the United States to work as a cook. Well, that is not necessarily going to work. Um, there has to be a match between their education and the position that they're going to come, be coming to work in the United States. So again, for an engineer, if they have a bachelor's degree in engineering and they're coming to the United States to work in the engineering field, then there is a match and that works. But I do get a lot of questions from people that have connections in the United States, have a potential employer, but their background doesn't necessarily match the, the profession that they want to go into, and that is a problem. Um, something else that is very unique to the H-1B visa is this prevailing wage requirement um, and labor certification requirement. So it's, in most of the other visa categories, you can prepare the filing and the supporting documents and file it without any pre-filing. With the H-1B, you have to be mindful that there is a pre-filing for labor certification. That labor certification basically is a filing with the Department of Labor in the United States that says, and that is from the employer, says, I, am, I want to hire this worker and I'm going to be paying them a certain amount. And that certification needs to come before the filing of the H-1B visa, before you come to see. If the H-1B is filed without the labor certification, most likely it's going to be returned or it's going to be uh, denied. Just kind of keep that in mind. Timing issues are critical on the H-1B because, as I mentioned before, there is a cap, there is a limit, and I'm going to talk about the cap, I believe, on the next slide. So timing of when you start preparing the, the labor conditions for the uh, application and the filing is, is very, very important. So here is the cap situation. There is 65,000 um, H-1B, new H-1B visas available uh, every year. Those visas become available in April. So you really have to be ready to file. I actually have already a waiting list for my 2016 filing um, for those that were not able to get them this year and for those that have called me since um, I'm going to try to file next year. So we begin working on this H-1Bs in February and we want to have them all done, including the labor certification, by the beginning of March, so that by April 1st, we are ready to file. So 65,000 new visas for those with a bachelor's degree and 20,000 visas for those that have a U.S. master's degree. So total of 85, and they, they pretty much disappear by April 5th or April 6th. The, the quota is open for, for a week at the beginning of April, and then once, once that quota is met, in fact, they, they accept everything for that week. So this year we had almost 200,000 uh, petitions that were filed for those 85. And what happens is there is a lottery, and then 85 petitions are selected for processing. So again, timing is, is critical, um, and, and it, it's a category that you really need to floor beyond um, if, you, if you're looking to come to the United States. Um, so that's it for the H-1B, and I don't see any questions relating to that. So I'm going to move on to, actually I have another H-1B cap continuum. Let me see, I, 
Oh, so it applies to new H-1B visas. However, there are some exceptions. So if you if you already have an H-1B, if you were counted under the cap in, in some year before, then in order to get an extension, you do not need to worry about the cap again. You can just file the extension. Um, if you're changing employers and you already, again, were counted under the cap, you can change your H-1B to a new employer as long as the first one was up, was counted under the cap. If you were able to obtain it at the next tab set, uh, there, there are certain institutions and organizations that are exempted from the cap. Um, I work with many hospitals and, and colleges, institutions of higher education and universities that are exempt from the cap. So the my uh, my clients that were able to obtain an H-1B through an institution of higher education, so a college, university, or a hospital that is affiliated to an institution of higher education, they're not countered under the cap. They're cap exempt. So I get physicians that have this cap exempt visa and they want to transfer now to a hospital that is not cap exempt. And that they have a problem because they, they have to apply for this lottery. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tricky um, visa. Um, it, it's wonderful if you can get one, but it can be tricky. Um, actually, I get a question here saying, and this is a good question, is that a total of 85,000 available throughout the entire country each year? Yes. It's scary. It's an scary answer. So yes, it's 85,000 total for the entire country for the year. And again, several years ago, when the economy was down, um, 2006, 2007, 2005, we didn't have a problem with, with the cap. I was filing a new H-1Bs in December without a problem. But since the economy, which is good, since the economy has rebounded uh, for the last three years, we have had uh, a lottery. So way more applications, petitions, than, than there are these available. So it's a good question. Hey, e. So for those of you that can qualify, this is an alternative, a potential alternative to the H-1B. Um, it's available for traders and investors. And I say for those of you that can qualify, because the first thing that I say when I'm considering the E-Visa is what country are you from? What is your nationality? Because if you're not a national of a treaty country, then you, you can't even begin to talk E-Visa. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, Colombia, Mexico are treaty countries. So for those of you that are listening from those countries, this, this could apply to you. Um, the cons, there is a lot of good things about the East, but there is also cons, uh, challenges. Uh, and one of those is basically you're a business owner. And E is for someone that is coming to the United States to open a business. They are entrepreneurials. They are willing to take the risk. Um, they're willing to come and manage and grow their own business, and, and that is challenging. And it's also challenging that in order to continue to renew your e and in the United States, you have to be uh, very proactive, you have to grow your business, you have to hire U.S. workers. So it's not just good enough for you to come and say, okay, I'm going to open my business, I'm going to employ myself and my wife, and that is you know, that, that's, that's, that's enough for my e-visa. That is enough to get you going, potentially, but not necessarily to keep you here. Uh, benefits is that there is no cap. Um, it's, it's open year-round. If you are from the treaty country uh, and you're, again, an entrepreneurial, have an entrepreneurial spirit, are willing to invest and, and and work really hard to grow your business, um, and you're a treaty country national, again, that's essential, you are. You should consider the E. Um, another benefit is your spouse uh, can obtain an employment authorization document, and some of those spouses work in the business. Some others find their own jobs in the United States. Um, so uh, that, that's need for you to consider. Validity is two years at a time, and then with renewals, as long as the business is doing well. And they still have a need, yes, a need visa slide. Something else that is a pro with this visa is that you don't necessarily have to apply to USCIS first. So the E visas are primarily controlled um, and, and, and managed by the Department of State. Um, so you could, without 
Flushing, you're now coming to the United States. You could, from your country, um, as long as you probably have an attorney here that can help you uh, open the business, set up um, the business, um, maybe hire a general manager before you even come to get the business up and going. That is done and you uh, meet the requirements of the visa, you can go to your consulate in your home country and apply there. I have many foreign nationals that come to the United States on a B1, B2, on a visitor visa, and uh, they come to scout, you know, what, what are the business opportunities. In fact, we just filed one a few weeks ago from someone from uh, Belgium. Um, he was here on a visitor visa. He explored his business options. Um, he decided he's young entrepreneurial. He's 27, 28 years old. Um, his parents had given him money to invest, um, and he loves to drive. We are in Florida, and there are many retirees that have problems driving. So the business that he created is almost like a Uber, and I don't know for those of you abroad if, if you know what that is, but it's almost like a taxi on demand uh, where you can email him, text him, call him, and say, you know, I need someone to drive me from my house to the airport. Um, so that's the kind of business that he set up. Um, now, he was here in the United States, and he didn't want to go home to process his visa, so we filed it with USCIS while he was here. But he could have gone home, file it in his home country, and then come in with the visa. That's a general overview of the E. Um, this are some samples of the treaty country. I got a question. Could an attorney seeking to open a U.S. law office apply for an E visa? Good question. Yes, they could. Again, um, several things, as, as, you, as I mentioned before. One, the first thing is treaty country. Are you a treaty country? A national of a treaty country. Two, it is not intended to be a, a visa so that you can come to the United States and, and, and you employ yourself. You have to have a business plan, typically a five-year business plan with your filing that shows how you're going to grow the business. So if you come to the United States to open a law office, and your business plan is that I'm going to start with myself, but I'm going to grow the business so that I'm going to, by year five, and I'm going to employ three, two, whatever, U.S. workers, either you know, secretaries, paralegals, or another attorney. If, if the business plan fits, um, it is certainly a possibility. So I hope that answers that question. Um, CN. So again, as I said before, there are some of you on the line that are from Mexico. Um, so this is one that you should pay attention to because in the world, again, of no H-1B, uh, the E's, the TN's, the L's, all of those become very, very relevant. Um, the TN, it, it, it's wonderful if you can apply. Um, again, the main things that you have to watch out for, my first question to the people coming to me is, are you a national of Mexico or Canada? If you're not, then it's, uh, and this does not apply to you. It was created by the NAFTA agreement, so the trade with Canada and Mexico, and so not only do you have to be a national of Mexico and Canada, but there is a list of professions that qualify. So if you're a pharmacist, and I'm just gonna throw out a few professions out there, if you're a pharmacist, which I've done, the pharmacist, again, I, I said I work with, with several hospitals. Um, so if I'm a, you're a pharmacist or a nurse, for example, in Canada or Mexico, and th those two professions are covered under NAFTA, NAFTA. If you're a Canadian, we can have you go to the border, prepare the package, prepare the filing, and you can present yourself at the border, and you can enter the United States in TN status. Um, so that's a huge, huge benefit of the PN. One, there's no cap, there's no prevailing wage, there is no wait for USCIS to adjudicate your petition. You can basically go to the port of entry and get it adjudicated there. Um, let me, so Canadians are visa exempt. So the Canadians have an even better, a better advantage because they can go to the port of entry. Now Mexican nationals, um, they still have an advantage because the TN is, 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 is way superior in terms of how you can process it. But for, for Mexicans, you do have to go to the consulate. You have to apply for a visa. 
once you get that in your passport, then you can come to the port of entry and be admitted in TN status. One of the drawbacks of the TN is that it does not have immigrant intent. So you do have to be careful if you're trying to apply for TN and later on for a green card. The timing has to be um, strategized because if you show that you have an intent to remain in the United States beyond the, the validity of your TN, you could have some issues getting a green. Here we go. Okay. So examples of TN, and then again, I said pharmacist, I probably said nurse, but there's a few more in here, so you can look through through this list. The L, as I mentioned before, it's another one that if in, if you could qualify, is is a very nice alternative for professionals to come to the United States. Um, but again, all of them have very specific requirements. So the L. Again, my first question to them or the person uh, calling me or, or wanting to hire us is, do, is there a company abroad that is related to the company in the United States that could perform that transfer? So that's one of the things. And the, the relationship has to be very specific. So the company in the U.S. or abroad, they have to be a parent, an affiliate, a subsidiary, branch and all the documentation relating to the incorporation of, of those entities and how they relate to each other are part of the, the application. Another thing that is critical is that the person applying for the beneficiary of that petition needs, needs to have worked abroad for at least one year in the prior three years for that company abroad. So it's not enough that you have two companies that are related. The beneficiary has to show that they have worked for that company abroad for at least one year. And we do that through, in fact, I'm working with a with with an L1A right now. They're coming from Manila. Uh, they're, the, the parent company is in India, in Chennai, and they have two branches, one in Manila, one in, in Texas here in the United States. Um, and the foreign national that we're transferring is, is, is in the Manila branch coming to the U.S. branch, has worked for the Manila office for over three years, worked in Chennai for over five years, and we're transferring him to the United States um, as, as a manager for, for one of the departments of the U.S. branch. So that gives you an idea of, of how this works. Um, something else that is critical, I have, I have some foreign nationals can come and say, well, I, I have the company abroad. I'm going to form a company in the United States. I have worked for the company abroad. Uh, and I want to come here and manage my U.S. company, but when I do that, I have no workers in the company abroad, and that's going to have to close. Well, if that is the case, then you do not have a case for the L1. Then the L1 is an intercompany transferee, so both companies have to be in existence and active. They, they have to be in business. You cannot just close the, the foreign branch and, and, and think that you, you can stay here in L1 status. So just keep that in mind. Um, it's, it's available for two categories of workers. One is the manager or executive, and that's an L1A, or those that have a specialized knowledge, and that's an L1B. And there is requirements for both of those and benefits. Um, the L1A has a maximum extension of seven years, which is nice. Uh, the L1B, five. So that's something to consider. Um, as I mentioned before in the presentation, the L's have dual intent, which again is, is a huge advantage because you can you have a smoother path to the EB1 uh, green card. The L1B does not lead you there; it has to be an L1A. And also, in order to have the smoother path to a green card, your position abroad has to have been in a managerial or executive capacity. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're when you're strategizing if the L is a possibility for you. And another benefit of the L is that the spouse of the L can get it at work work document. EAD is employment authorization document. If you're coming to the United States to open a new office, there is a significant amount of provisions and, and things, requirements that have to be met. So just again keep that in mind. So good. So here's one of my favorite visas, 
it, it, they require a lot of work. But when you get uh, when you get them done and you get them approved, they're 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 terrific. I actually said to my legal assistant the other day, um, I learned so much doing BOs because you really really have to know the specialty area um, of of the people that you're working with. So they are for individuals who possess an extraordinary ability in the sciences, the arts, education, business, or athletics. I've done probably O's in each one of those categories. I'm working right now with an athlete um, that is at the top of his field. Um, so we are preparing a very extensive O1 uh, petition showing the you know, and I'll go through, there's various categories of things that you have to show that the person has achieved. Um, and so you, you document that heavily um, and you get letters and support and whatnot. But it's, uh, again, if you can qualify, it's a very good uh, visa just because you know, there's no cap. Um, it has a fairly easier path to a green car. Um, and you can find that I at the top of your field. Is, uh, when you're coming to the United States, you need to be coming in the United States to continue to work in that capacity. So, for example, my athlete, um, if he was uh, extraordinary abroad as an athlete, but he was coming to the United States not to work as an, as an athlete, for example, he was now wanting to work as a coach, which happens many, many times. I get the call that, I, you know, I'm I was extraordinary football player abroad, but now I'm, I've been offered this position to coach in the United States. Well, that 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 is a problem, um, and there's there's quite a few denials, and there's a lot of case law out there where uh, even there was one about a week ago uh, that it went even to the to the circuit court, federal circuit court. There's just not many cases, immigration cases that get to that level, and it was that specific situation. It was a gymnast um, that had extraordinary records from, from her um, professional career abroad coming to the United States to coach gymnastics and the circuit court said no, we know that some of the skills are transferable but you are not necessarily an extraordinary coach so we're not going to give you the help. So what are those things that you need to show? Um, so in order to get an O1 there is a there is a list of criteria that you need to meet, um, and you need to meet at least three of the criteria that is outlined in, in the regulations. And this are some of them. I didn't put the whole list up here. Well, actually, one if you have a Nobel, you're a Nobel Prize winner. That's that's you get it. That's pretty much you get it from the get go. I haven't had those kind of clients yet. Maybe one day as I continue to work in this field. Most of my clients are are. They're extraordinary in their own way, but not necessarily at the Nobel Prize level. Um, so we we work with the categories that I have listed here. They've received awards. They've been recognized nationally and internationally for those. There have been materials that have been published because of, of the work that they have done. Uh, they've contributed in some way, uh, contributed original work um, to, to, to their field or they have been employed in a critical or, or essential capacity, for example, my athlete, um, as a result of his work and, and his ability, his athletic ability, the teams that he has been um, employed by have won a lot of championships and cups and things. So that's one of the elements that we're using um, because of his skills, uh, his work, and, and his, his prizes and awards have been published in national and international media. So we're also using that, and we're also using the fact that he, again, has, has received prizes and awards for, uh, for that. Um, I get a question here saying the O1 is similar to the National Interest Waiver. Um, if some of the criteria is applicable um, with the National Interest Waiver, so the O1, again, it's a non-immigrant visa category, National Interest Waiver is when we get into the green card category. And in order to obtain a national interest waiver, you have to show that your, your, you come into the United States and you work in the United States, it's going to benefit the United States as a whole in some level. And in order to show that, you do have to show some of the criteria that you, have, that you use for an L. So when I said before that they owe it a nice path to the green card, 
is because some of the documentation and some of the evidence that we use for the O is transferable to uh, an EB1 extraordinary ability alien or sometimes the national interest labor category. So that's a good question. So family base. Um, there is only there there's a few employment options out there, but as you know now from, from, from this presentation, they all have pros and cons. Um, there is some very limited, like the TN, only available for Mexicans and Canadians, only available for certain professions. The E is only available for those countries that we have treaties with. The, you know, the O, you have to be at the top of your field. The L, you have to have the company abroad, the company here, both open. I mean, they all, the H's, they have the caps uh, and, and other things. So they all have something going on. Uh, and many times, the the option that some foreign nationals take again, if if it's truly for love, is the family-based uh, route to permanent residency. I had a call last week, a consult that we did uh, for a lady that is here in the United States on an H-1B visa. Um, unfortunately, the she the, the work that she did, the contract um, for the so the company, her company had a contract with another company for the work that she did. That contract went away. Um, so now she doesn't have a job necessarily with that company, um, with that employer. So that employer, she, they haven't told her yet, but she kind of thinks that her job may be eliminated. Um, so she called me to say, to tell, what are my options? You know, I have this age that is it, it's been counted under the cap, so she has an age that could be transferable to another employer if she finds another employer. So I have that option, and I've also been dating a U.S. citizen for the last five years, and and I don't know, I don't, you know, I don't know what my options are. So I said to her, well, you know, if you find an employer um, fairly soon, because again, if you're if you're you're terminated by your job, and, and what is holding you in, you in the United States is your H-1B visa, and that goes away because you don't no longer have a, have a job, then you start accruing what is called a lawful presence. Um, and they, at that point, you either have to decide whether you go home or whether you explore very, very quickly any of these other options that we have talked about. So I said to her, look, if you think that you have an employer that is going to be willing to transfer your age, and that happens within the next month or two, then you know take that route if if, if that's available to you. And if not, uh, you should seriously consider uh, this this family-based permanent residence. And I don't recommend this lightly. Uh, I don't want anyone coming to the United States or trying to stay in the United States by marrying a U.S. citizen just because of of, of of the benefit of the green card process, that's totally a no-no. But if in her case, they have been dating for five years, and, and I said to her, if that, if you really see that as your future, then this might be the option for you. So, with that background, um, if if you if you have been in a relationship with a U.S. citizen, and there is there is other ways to get to family base. There's a there's a category of 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 uh, the first first preference, second preference, third preference, blah, blah, blah. I didn't put all those slides in here because it could get too complicated. Uh, but let's say the simplest and the ones that many times I do the most is marriage to a U.S. citizen. Um, that is a two-part process. It's, it's an immigrant petition that is filed at the M-130 and typically concurrently the adjustment of status, which is what leads to the green card. Um, again, you have to really show that that the relationship is in existence and is for love and not um, to get you to a green card. The employment-based category for the green card is typically a three-part process. And I say typically because if you're able to show that you're an extraordinary ability alien or that you could qualify for a national interest waiver, then we eliminate the labor certification piece of the of of this process, so the first part of the process, the PERM, uh, which is taking right now about a year, that goes away. And and then you're dealing with I-140 and I-485. But in the majority of the cases, because it's hard to show that 
people are extraordinary ability. And, and again, there's we really have to be at the top of the field, so not everybody's there. Um, so the majority of the green card employment base cases go through this three-part process. Labor certification, which again, it's taken about a year, and that part of the process includes recruiting, so your employer, the sponsoring employer is, is trying to recruit uh, for a U.S. worker to fill that position that you would eventually have if the employer cannot find a U.S. worker. If they cannot, and the process proceeds, and you receive a labor certification certified at the end of the year, then you can move on and do the I-140, um, I-485 petition, which is, if you remember from the prior slide, it's similar to the two-step uh, family base. So the I-140 is the equivalent of the I-130, and the I-485 is your um, adjustment of status. So it's really these are things that I just want you to keep in mind. So these are collateral issues. Um, so sometimes we're really focused on, you know, do I qualify for, for this particular visa for this green card? And then we kind of forget all these other things that are, that are also uh, critical. So extensions and changes of status. It, it, if you're not working with an attorney, with, with me, I have a, a, a case management system that tracks um, all my extensions, the ends of the status, and, and things like that, it, and it gives me reminders. Um, and that helps me help my clients. Um, but if you're not, um, it's very easy to forget, oh my gosh, you know, my age will be it's about to expire two weeks from now. Well, that's a problem. Um, so keeping track of, of when you're, you need to file an extension of the status or a change of the status is critical. Travel and visa issues also, um, the, the consulates abroad have extreme discretion. Sometimes we think USCIS is difficult to deal with, and then we have to deal with the consulate, and that's even worse. Um, they have absolute power, absolute discretion. There is no appeal. So when, and, and many foreign nationals take it very lightly, um, and, and I super prep. My, my foreign nationals when they have to go to a consulate interview because I want them to be ready and prepare for any kind of questions that they may get. Because if they don't get that visa, they're not coming. So that is that is important. It's very important also that, that you keep track of when your visa is about to expire because if you leave the country and your visa expires when you're out abroad, you're not going to be able to come back unless you renew that visa and you have basis for renewing it. So it's important. Derivative beneficiaries, again, somehow they're forgotten. I, I have transfer H-1Bs that I say to the foreign national, okay, I didn't do your first age. I, you know, you have a spouse, give me a copy of their H-4, um, and they don't have it because nothing was filed for them. Um, so I know that, you know, it, it's hard to believe that people forget their spouses and their kids, and, but the immigration process can get so com complex that some things get left behind. Um, so, again, all of those things are things to keep track of. Violations of the status on local presence, for example, the, the, the example that I just gave you that the, the client that called me last week that we did a consult with, um, things like that are going to happen. You, you're here, uh, something is going to happen to your employment. What do you do then? Um, so always, always planning ahead and knowing as much as you can is critical. So I, I congratulations to all of you that are on this call. Uh, you may think, or, or hopefully some of you, some of this that you're learning today is, is very helpful for you. I hope that your reviews are good and you say, yay, Margaret, we learned a lot uh, through this presentation. Uh, and at the end of the day, sometimes, you know, I've learned things a year ago that I thought, I, I don't know when I'm going to apply this again. And then, oh my gosh, it, it, that knowledge comes back because it, 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 I need it and it's helpful. So hopefully, sooner or later, um, some of these things are going to help you in your career. And again, planning and knowing ahead is, is essential. So that, that follows to this, the same form. I know that there is a lot of information out there on the internet. Um, that's not legal advice. Um, we all do that. I mean, I'm, I use Google and, I, and, and all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, if I follow the wrong advice, 
and, and, and in immigration, I've, I've said to many people, if you get a denial, overcoming that denial is almost impossible. So you, you, you're doing yourself a disfavor by not filing the best petition that you can and seeking advice and guidance, even if you have to pay for a consult, it is worth it uh, because the time of the amount of money, time, and mental stress that comes from not doing it right at the, from the get go it, it's awful. So keep your current your status current. That is also critical. And again, hear me say this again and again: plan ahead, plan ahead, plan ahead. Uh, we typically start working on cases four to six months in advance of planning. I'm working with someone else in 901. Um, he's from Argentina. We, we did his first 01 three years ago. Now we're getting ready for a renewal. His 01 doesn't, doesn't expire until February. So we're getting, we're starting to get letters and publications and all that right now because you just, you just never know what's going to happen. So as long as, I mean, as long as my clients are willing to, and they typically are, to start working early, that, that is what we do. Um, let's see. Some of you, um, I, I, I'm going to want resources in order to practice law in the United States or just general resources for immigration. Um, I've listed here three sites that I use. Um, so the American Immigration Lawyers Association is, 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 is awesome. Uh, you cannot practice law in the United States and not be a member. Now, some information in there is public. Um, some it's, it's only for members, so but it's a it's a it's a huge resource. Chris, uh, USCIS, so the Immigration Services website in the United States is, is very good, um, and the Immigration Legal Resource Center is also a good 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 resource for you all. Um, actually, this is a bonus resource for you, and this one is for me. Uh, from me, uh, we talked about uh, you know travel and things that you have to be careful about and, and status, maintaining your status. This is a, a ten essentials resource that I put. It's a little ebook um, that I prepare that I, I give to my clients. Um, if you want to get a copy of this, you can just click on that link, and I believe Margaret may be able to send it out to others. Um, in order to download it, though, you. you put in your email address and what that does, it, it allows you to download it. It also adds, adds you to our newsletter. We put a newsletter out once a month. Um, it is, it's chore. We typically cover five to six, six of the top things that happen in immigration law that month. Um, and there is no commercials. There is no ads. It's just good information. So hopefully you will um, enjoy this resource and, and our newsletter in the future. And I think that is all I have for you. Um, if you have, and I've been answering questions as they come in in the chat. Um, I don't see anything there right now. So if you have a question um, that, again, is not personal to you, but it's just a general question that could benefit others, uh, please go ahead and put it in there. Here to speculate on the resolution of that's the BUS. No, I won't. <laughs> there are some things that you should Something do. Else? That's a great question. And, and Giselle, let me thank you again. For those of you who joined us late, Giselle Carson is a graduate of Florida Coastal School of Law, practicing immigration attorney, and also we're really excited, president of the Jacksonville Bar Association. So we're really honored, Giselle, that you took the time you know, to join us today. Um, I'm Margaret Ioannidis with the uh, LLM programs here at Florida Coastal. And um, I'm going to put a question out there, Giselle, on behalf of um, our students. Um, we frequently get the question uh, for those that are in the U.S. Law LLM program. They're foreign educated attorneys. Um, upon completion of our program, they're able to take either the California or Washington State bars. Um, and they're looking, for instance, if they have the bar licensure in one of those states, but they're living somewhere else in the country, or maybe they want to advise clients in other part of the country, are they able to do so in the field of immigration law? And do you have any recommendations for students that are in that position and might be considering a career in that field? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, so immigration is one of the probably few areas um, uh, that, that is, 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 well, there's other areas, but it's one of the areas that is, is 
it's a federal um, a federal law. So whether you are, and I think you heard me mention, uh, you know, we're doing uh, an L1 right now for uh, someone that is abroad in, in Manila, Chennai is the parent company, and their their my client is in Texas, and I'm in Florida. Um, I don't have many of those cases. My, the majority of my clients are local clients, and I do that for for many reasons, primarily because I believe immigration law it's it, it, it's very personal, um, and you want to be able to to touch your clients as much as you can and, and be close to them. It's a good thing. But your question, um, you could you know you could you could be licensed in California, and and be handling cases in New York. And, and live in California and and, friend, and and handle cases in New York and Hawaii. Uh, it is it's federal law as long as you're admitted to practice in, in one of the states and you're in good standing there, um, you should be able to practice immigration. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, of what is you know what is how how do you get into the field? As I mentioned before, the American Immigration Law Association. It is it, it, it's fabulous. I don't know how, how to, I could not practice immigration law without being a member of, of that organization um, because there's so much happening. And it's impossible for, for us practicing attorneys to be able to keep track of what is going on. AILA condenses that information. I get an email every day with the AILA top 10, top 5, I can't even remember. I think it's top 7. And every single day I open it up, I look at it, and I see what, okay, these are the things that I have to keep track of that are, that are going on. And those are the things that at the end of the month I kind of condense and, and send to my clients in the newsletter, you know, five or six. So it's, it's an evolving area of law. You, you, you need to be, if you're going to be solo, even if you're, like, I'm in a firm of, of about 25 attorneys, but I'm the only practitioner that practices immigration law. So I really need a network of other attorneys that are practicing in the area that are helping, that, that we can exchange ideas and, and AILA provides you with, with, that, um, with that platform. So if that answers that. Thank you. And one question, um, Giselle, when, when I practice immigration law, I remember AILA had mentors available, and I wonder if they still have the mentors available? They do. So I'm a member of the uh, Latin American chapter. I think they just changed their name to Caribbean, just to be more inclusive. Caribbean and Latin American or something like that. When it was inaugurated, it was a Latin American chapter. And I also belong to the Central Florida chapter. Um, and both of those. So AILA is the, the, the umbrella organization. And then within that, they have local chapters throughout the United States. And those local chapters have mentors. In fact, I also used a mentor um, when, I, when I started, um, you know, more formal than, than what I have right now. So, yes. Um, they, and, and again, you, you, need to have, you need to have someone or, or several people um, mm -hmm. that you need to go to to, to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any advice for students about how to become Immigration attorney. Um, I'm not sure. So, I mean, for example, um, Florida Coastal has a clinic, um, an immigration. It's it, it, it's it's kind of a broad question because it all depends on what you want to do and also what what opportunities are there for you. Some people go into the practice of immigration law because they think that they're going to like it, and when they get into the field. They realize it, it's very complex. There's a lot of things that you could be that you need to keep track of. And out of the many areas that you could practice in the United States, it's really not a high money maker. Margaret can probably hopefully attest to that. I mean, I do it because I love what we do. Um, in fact, yesterday we got an approval on an H1B extension, and this 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 person. Uh, was recapturing time, so he had been, so he he had used up his six months, uh, his six years of H-1B, but he went home to renew his visa and and got stuck at the consulate. This was before my time, uh, and so he was abroad for over seven months. 
that he could not come back and work in the United States. So there is a provision on the DH1B that if you spend time abroad, you can come to the United States and, and recapture that time. So what we did is we submitted an extension to recapture that time. And just yesterday, it was the case that was pretty process. Yesterday, we got the email from the ISA. Your extension has been approved. So my legal assistant called him said, by the way, you know, your extension's been approved, you're good to be here for another seven months. We have a green card process going for him that is on the work, but it's, it's taking long, as, as they all do. And he was crying on, on the phone. He was like, Tyra, we cannot thank you enough. I don't know what, I, you know, I don't know what I could have done. And I sent an email back to her and I said, oh my gosh, that makes my day. That makes her day. We're able to touch and change lives. It, 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 it's such a rewarding profession, but at the same time, it has a lot of down. So I would, to, to answer this question, that was a long, long story, I would suggest that you try to join a clinic if you can. As some, and I mentioned Florida Coastal because they have a clinic, they have an immigration clinic. Try to, try to, try to see what it's like. Uh, to practice immigration law and, and keep up with what is going on before you really say this is what I want to do. And maybe you do know if, if it is what you want to do, then I would say start by joining AILA, the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Start going to their conferences, meet the people in the field, and that would, you know, help you get started. Mm -hmm. With that, I think our time is up. I really hope you've enjoyed this. I um, I certainly have. I, I appreciate the fact that you guys are active, interactive, and, and have sent me questions. I hope you found this, this helpful, and I look forward. Maybe if this goes well, we'll do one or two more. I don't know. So uh, thank you again. Thank you, Margaret, for, for the opportunity. Absolutely, and Giselle, thank you very much for joining us. For all of you who joined us today, uh, you'll be receiving an email from our team here that contains the PowerPoints as well. Um, and so please feel free to reach out to us with any questions that you might have. For any of you interested in joining AILA, if you are students at Florida Coastal in the LLM program, please reach out to Ana Razach. Um, I've included her contact information in the chat feature, and she can provide an enrollment verification letter to confirm your student status. I would also echo um, what Giselle mentioned about, um, you know, just getting some experience in the field of immigration if any of you are thinking about the field. AILA also offers pro bono opportunities, so you could volunteer there as well. So I guess with that said, again, thank you very much, Giselle, for joining us. Thank you to all of you for joining us. And we will continue the speaker series monthly, so be on the lookout for additional information about the next event. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.